All right, we're going to read from Titus chapter 2. If you'd find the location of where you want to sit and stand, if you would stand for the reading of God's word, Titus chapter 2, verses 1 through 10. But as for you, teach what accords with sound doctrine. Older men are to be sober-minded, dignified, self-controlled, sound in faith, in love, and in steadfastness. Older women, likewise, are to be reverent in behavior, not slanderers or slaves to much wine. They are to teach what is good, and so train the young women to love their husbands and children, to be self-controlled, pure, working at home, kind and submissive to their own husbands, that the word of God may not be reviled. Likewise, urge the younger men to be self-controlled. Show yourselves in all respects to be a model of good works, and in your teaching show integrity, dignity, and sound speech that cannot be condemned, so that an opponent may be put to shame, having nothing evil to say about us. Bond servants are to be submissive to their own masters in everything. They are to be well-pleasing, not argumentative, not pilfering, but showing all good faith, so that in everything they may adorn the doctrine of God our Savior. God, thank you for your word. Lord, thank you for everyone who's come this morning to hear it preached, to worship together, to live in community. Lord, we thank you for um, the idea of the church, that we aren't left alone to try and figure out uh, what you've said, that we can um, live in community and understand it in that context. Uh, Lord, we look forward to the day that we are all uh, perfectly sanctified and made holy in heaven, or that our communion with you and with each other will be perfect. We look forward to that day, and, and uh, Lord, we ask that your kingdom come, your will be done on earth now as it is in heaven. God, I uh, come before you a frail, weak man, um, and I ask, Lord, that your strength uh, would be shown through, that it wouldn't be me, that it would be you, and that you would give me all that I need today, this morning, to preach your word. Lord, I ask that you would also open the hearts of everyone here uh, to be attentive to what you want them to do, how you want to change their lives uh, in light of your word. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. All right, so the context here, again, is Titus on the island of Crete. You remember that Paul left Titus behind uh, to organize the churches. So, Paul and Titus apparently had come and been preaching the gospel and people were coming to faith. And so you have these believers scattered throughout this island of Crete in the middle of the Mediterranean. And Titus was left behind to organize them, to put them together into a body of believers. And that's the context for which this book is written. First, we looked at the the elders. That was the first requirement. Put leadership over the churches. Uh, The people are being swayed by false teachers and false doctrine you need to put leadership in place people who have sound doctrine who have high moral character who can guard and protect the church against these things and so he went through the requirements of false teachers and uh, the requirements of teachers uh, elders and then through the requirements or the uh, opposition the false teachers second we looked at how the church is to relate to one another and we started with old men And that is the foundation, right? That old men are to set the example for the rest of the church. And so we looked at that in great detail last week. If you'll remember from last week, we talked about uh, age, uh, recovering a biblical view of age. Uh, In uh, our society, age is despised. It is uh, looked down on. It is something to not go to, but you want to stay young. That's the whole mantra of our of our culture and yet the biblical view of age is that age is something to be honored uh, to be cherished to be uh, sought after and that if you are to attain a certain age that is a blessing from the Lord not something to be ashamed of and so when we come to our context in verse 3 is which we're going to start covering this morning verse 3 through 5 he says likewise older women so in the same way that the old men are to be dignified and carry themselves in a godly way to apply sound doctrine to their lives the old women are to do the same and he gives a few more requirements now when he says old women again if you remember from last week it's the it's the word old not uh, comparative older but objectively old now uh, 
this is where it starts to get kind of touchy because uh, I don't want to be offensive, but I want you to feel honored when I say old woman. Um, in our culture, even in our hearts, we still balk at that word and say, oh, you can't call a woman old. No, certainly you can because the Bible does. And so what is he talking about, old women? Who is that? Well, it's, as we learned last week, it's someone who is beyond childbearing and child-rearing years. If we look at First Timothy, he talks about uh, he talks about widows who are old and widows who are young, and he separates at the age of 60. Um, so that seems to be the context. Somewhere in that 50 to 60 year range is when you start to become an old woman. And is it particular age? That's no. That's not the important thing. The important thing is that you have gone through all of the seasons of life, and you have now arrived at a stage where you understand what it is to be human, and and in this context, what it is to be a woman. Um, that you have seen the trials, the hardships, the difficulties of life, and now you have reflected on those things in light of God's word and have attained wisdom. And so that's who he's talking to here in verse 3. Now what's interesting as well is that he uses the word older women, not grandmothers. And you might expect him to use the word grandmothers because he's going to talk much about children and husbands and that sort of thing, but he doesn't. He particularly uses the word old women. It isn't as though in the Greek he didn't have the word for grandmother available. We know in First uh, First Timothy, he talks about uh, sorry Second Timothy he talks about Lois, Timothy's grandmother, his uh, his mame in the Greek. Uh, and if you any of you new grandmothers are looking for a nickname for yourself, you know many of you want a nickname. Mame is not a bad choice. Kind of sounds like mommy, so maybe it's not a great choice. But if you want the Greek word, there it is. And so Paul has this word available to him, and he doesn't use it here. Why? Because that's not the context. The context is the relationship of the church as a whole. He's not talking about here family relationships, as in grandmother to daughter to granddaughter. No, he's talking about how we here, not related by blood, are to relate to one another in a godly way. And so here's the context. Older women and younger women, not necessarily related by blood. Not exclusively wives and mothers either. He could have said wives he could have said mothers, but he doesn't say that. No, he says women generally, old women specifically. Now, m- likely in this context, there would have been, you would have had a husband and you would have had children, but not necessarily. And so he's not trying to exclude anybody, even though in this verse, he's going to cover many of the things that are commonly dealt with uh, for a woman of this age. So therefore, mothers, motherly experience and wifely experience are not required for you to continue to listen today. So ladies, all of you, listen. You may not have had children. Maybe you're an old woman who who never had children. Still applies to you. Maybe you didn't get married. This still applies to you. So listen. The context here is of church relationship, not family relationships. Now, this doesn't mean that the things that we're going to cover here don't also apply to the family. Many of them do apply to the family. And it is necessary for a family, a church, a family within the church to be healthy and to apply these things to their lives. That is true also. But that's not specifically what we're going to be talking about today. So, training your granddaughter does not check the box of Titus 2. Training your daughter does not check the box of Titus 2. There's more to it than that, okay? I want you to understand that because if you don't understand that, you'll not, you won't be able to hear what is being said. You say, okay, I, I, am, I am doing Titus 2. I am training my daughter. I am training my granddaughter. Well, no, 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 no. That's not what it's talking about. It's saying, hey, there is a lady sitting here in this church who is your daughter in Christ, who is not your daughter And this applies to you in that relationship. So I want that to be clear in your thinking as we go through this, that what he's trying to say is, don't just look inside of your family, look around you in your church and think of the people in the church as your daughters in Christ. Now, why is this so important for Crete? Well, let's think about the context of Crete. This was, Titus was written in about AD 60, roughly, early 60s maybe. So when did Jesus die? AD 33, let's say. So that means that best case scenario, the most mature believers, the ones who have been believers the longest, we're talking about 30 years. They've only been a believer for 30 years. Now, if you were in your 60s, an old woman, 
And you, that means you became a believer when you were 30. What that then means is that you didn't grow up in a Christian home. None of these people in these churches grew up in a Christian home. They have no idea what it's like to grow up in a Christian home. They all grew up in pagan homes. Matter of fact, they grew up in homes filled with liars, evil beasts, and lazy gluttons. That's their context. That's their home life that they grew up in. They don't know what it is to raise their children in the fear and admiration of the Lord. They don't know what it is to submit to a husband in a godly way. They need somebody to train them, to show them. This isn't so different from our context. Many of you probably did not grow up in a Christian home. You didn't have a godly example. Maybe you did, but it was nominal at best. You don't know what it is to raise the chil- your children in a godly way. Your mothers probably didn't set a good example. For some of you, maybe they did. For others of you, it may not be the case. So this is not so abstract from where we are today. And what Paul is saying is that the old women need to step up and fill this role. So who is qualified? Who is qualified to fill this role of an older woman to a younger woman? It's someone who's currently living a godly life that's based on sound doctrine. That's the only requirement. Now, none of these ladies grew up in the church, remember. So it isn't as though they all did it right, and now that they're old, they've done it all right, and they can explain how to do that right again. No, these women all grew up heathens, miscreants, messing everything up, and now here they are at the end of their life, believers, and they're reflecting on how they've messed it up, and they're to teach the young women, don't do that, do it this way. Very few of them would have raised their children in a godly way. Very few of them would have even been believers when they got married. The point is that our past doesn't disqualify us from being effective in the present. If God's grace has trained you to be godly, you are qualified to train the next generation. So I want you, old ladies, to stop telling me you're not qualified. You are qualified to disciple and mentor the next generation. So long as you've been trained by grace and you're walking in faith with the Lord. Don't tell me you're not. God says that you are. God's not a liar. Okay, but why old women? Why not the elders? Why, isn't, why aren't the elders responsible for this, for training the young women? Well, I can think of two reasons. One, Primarily, it would be inappropriate. Think about uh, how we said that sound doctrine is applied relationally. Intimate, personal relationships. Um, That's a precarious situation for Titus to be in, is it not? For Titus, a young man, or even an old man, to then have a deep personal relationship with a young woman puts yourself in a very compromising situation. So it's something to be avoided. The second problem is that Titus has no idea what it is to be a young woman. He just doesn't. He doesn't get it. Right? Contrary. Well. Yeah. Men and women are different. And uh, contrary to popular opinion these days, we don't need men teaching women how to be men. We need women teaching women how to be women. Men, and men don't understand what it is to be a young woman. We can observe things intellectually. We can think about them. I can think about what it is to be a woman. I can, I can study them. I can try and figure them out. I have one job, and that's to understand my wife. Right? I am to understand her as best I can, and I struggle. But it's not my job to try and figure out women generally. It's a losing task. And so we can't relate at the same level that an old woman can. Elders must be men. That's a requirement. So if elders must be men, that leaves a void for these young women. Who is to train them? Who is to come alongside them? Who is to walk intimately in their life to train them to be godly? Well, simply, the old women. That's your job. 
And Paul is calling the old women to step up and fill that void that's there. Okay, so how do you fill that gap? Okay, now we get back into the text. Older women likewise are to be reverent in behavior. How do you fill that gap? First, you set the example. Just like the old men last week are to set the example, the old women likewise are to set the example. They are to be reverent in behavior. What this word means is to be priestly or to be like a priestess in the temp- serving in the temple of God. That is their general demeanor. That is how they walk through life is they act like priestesses, to be in the presence of God. That's how they carry themselves. Similar to how old men were to be dignified, old women are to be priestesses. And your body is a temple of God. So isn't that true of us anyway? Even more so for an old woman who's been walking with the Lord. Now, there are two ways that the Cretans in particular were tempted to not be reverent in behavior. And I think this is, he brings up these two in particular, not because there weren't others, there probably were others, but there's two in particular for a reason that he identifies. First, he says slanderer, and second, drunken. Now, we know the Cretans were liars, evil beasts, and lazy gluttons. And he says, don't be like that. Don't be a liar. Don't be a slanderer. Don't go around spreading lies, gossiping about people, talking about them behind their back or even to their faces in a negative way. He says, no, you old women, don't fall into that trap. Don't be like your old self. Be like your new self. Now, the temptation I've seen is that you interact with somebody and you suppose in your mind that they think or or are behaving in a certain way, and you come to conclusions not based on the facts, but you, in your own mind, develop these ideas about what their intentions were. Instead of working that out with them, no, you go and you, you talk about them behind your back, and you stir it up over here, and you go over here, and this is what it is to, to meddle and gossip and be a liar. He says, don't, don't behave in those ways. Don't gossip. Don't Don't talk about people behind their back. And secondly, don't be a drunk, a beastly glutton, someone who overindulges in drink, which leads to a lack of self-control. How is it, how does a spy get somebody to talk? They want information out of them. How do they get them to talk? You can either A, torture them, not very effective because you blow your cover, or B, you take them down to the local pub, get them slash drunk, and then they just start spilling the beans. Right? They just start letting it fly. They lose self-control. Inhibitions go out the window, and they just start talking. So why these two things? Well, he's going to call the old women to disciple and equip the young women to train them. How many young women are going to open up and share their hardship with an old woman who is a drunkard and a gossip. Ain't going to happen. She's not talking to you because she knows that whatever she shares is just going to circulate within the church. That young woman has to know that if I open up to her and I share what's going on and the pain and the hurt that I'm experiencing, the things I'm struggling with, I'm going to share it with this person and it's going to stop right there. I know she's self-controlled. She's not going to get drunk and just share my business with everybody. She's not a gossip. She's not going to go and stir it up around behind my back. I know that if I talk to her, her character is upright and faithful and she is going to keep it between us and that's it. That's what it is to be an old woman. Not to be a slanderous gossip, to be a drunk. You do that, give in to what the false prophets were doing. They were unfit for any good work. And the young woman's going to come running to you with their problems. So old women are to set the example, be the kind of person that the younger woman wants to be around, wants to, so that they can trust them. Secondly, the old women are to actively teach and train what is good to the young women. Or which young women? All of the young women in the whole world know. Remember, this is the context of the church, how the church is to relate to one another. Now, This is not an exclusive statement that is, um, at a certain level, discipleship should be happening at every age. And every age is good to disciple. But there's something special and unique that God has gifted you old women to do. He has gifted you with the gift of age combined with wisdom 
to then apply to a young woman's life. That's something special and unique, and that's what he's talking about here in this context. You can relate at a different level than the elders can. Your patience, your wisdom, reverent in behavior, priestess. What is it to be a priestess? You're in constant prayer. You live the power of prayer. This is something I've observed between old people and young people. When they come into my office, we have conversations, especially true of older women. They either start or end in prayer. Not because I said so. They just do. Prayer is their world. They've learned that prayer is vital for life. And that's what they do. They pray and pray and pray. Matter of fact, the longest running prayer group in this church happens to be old women. Now, if you're in that group, I apologize. I don't mean to be offensive here, but according to Paul's, this is Paul said this, 60 plus. Those ladies pray every single week. I don't know of any other group that gets together as often, as frequently, and as consistently as the old women do. They are priestesses. But being an example is not enough. You must be active. He says, they are to teach what is good and so train the young women. Now, the word train here is to to urge or make someone to be self-controlled. You're to, to urge them into self-control. That's what the word train means here in the Greek. And when you compi- combine that right with teach and train, what you realize is this is an intimate, personal relationship, specific, individualistic, and relational, not general, not what I'm doing right now. There is a place for women to teach other women in a context like this. Sure, that's a good, there's, a good, there's a lot of good that comes from it. That's not what he's talking about here. What he's talking about here is to show somebody how sound doctrine specifically applies to their situation and what they're struggling with. Let me show you. Let me walk alongside you and show you. Pastor Nathan said on Sunday morning this, that, and the other. Let me show you how that comes to bear on your life here in this specific situation. That's what he's talking about. Train them and teach them to be self-controlled. That is godly. Now, what are they to teach? What are they to teach? Let's read verses 4 and 5. So train the young women to love their husbands and children, to be self-controlled, pure, working at home, kind, and submissive to their own husbands, that the word of God may not be reviled. Okay, we have packaged here two things. Love their husbands and children. And these are really adjectives in the Greek. It's a a husband lover and a children lover. That you love your own children. You love your own husband. This is something that marks your character, generally speaking. There are times, of course, when you won't, and you'll struggle in that. But it's something that largely defines your character. I love my husband. I love my children. As with all of these requirements, must be true of you old women now. Now, if you don't have a husband, you're off the hook. Good for you. A little bit easier. But if you do have a husband, you must love him by choice. And then teach the young women to do the same. Some husbands are easier to love than others. But they must all be loved. Believer, non-believer. Kind or a jerk, rude or polite, hardworking, lazy glutton. They all have to be loved by their wives. We're all called to, you're all called to love them. And if you see a young woman struggling to love her jerk of a husband, it's your job to come alongside her and help her in that. I know what it is to live, love a, a jerk of a husband. I've been through it. Let me show you how to do that well. You need to urge her to love him. You figured it out, so train her how to do it. What we notice about this command, though, is that it's something that is teachable, learnable, and doable. It's a choice, not a feeling. It says, train them to love their husbands, which means that it probably doesn't come very naturally. 
We don't train to do stuff that's natural to us. We have to train to do stuff that's hard. Jesus chose to love us. Why? Because we were so lovable? No. We were not lovable. He chose to love us, and then he saved us and made us lovable by his own grace. But he loved us before we were lovable. And that's what he's calling you wives to do to your husbands. Love us even when we're unlovable. And when it's hard, go ask an old lady to help you. You can learn to love your jerk husband. And if you don't know how, go ask an old lady. Don't ask me. Children, likewise, similarly, are to love them. Now, raising children has not gotten any easier in the last 30 years, old ladies. It's still very difficult and exhausting as ever. It can be very extremely tempting for a young, sleep-deprived, overwhelmed mom to turn her kid away, to reject him, to not treat him well. She is to love her screaming, tantrum-throwing little child. She needs help doing it. The old ladies need to come alongside her. Encourage them. Pray with them. Don't just pray for them. Pray with them. Love them back into loving that child when they are elbow deep in poop. And this child is screaming at them when they're trying to do good. They're losing it. They need some encouragement along the way. Young moms can be tempted to forget that children are a blessing from the Lord. They fall into the trap of complaining about their children. There's so much work. They keep me from being productive. They keep my house from being clean. They keep me from getting a good job. Old ladies, you come alongside of them when they're struggling in this way, and you say, it's okay. Your children are a blessing from the Lord. Remember that. I know it's hard now, but you'll see. When, I, when you get grandkids, it makes it all worth it. Am I right, grandparents? Yeah, I see. I, I don't know that experientially, but I've heard that from many of you that grandkids make it worth it. So you come along and you encourage them. Hey, stick with it. Continue to walk in the Lord. They'll turn out okay. Just keep teaching them the things of the Lord. I'm here for you. This is what it is to be an old woman. Next, they're to teach them self control. And this really ties into the last two husband lover, child lover. Wives and moms uh, lose it sometimes. Right? They, uh, not that my wife has ever experienced this, but you know, you got the kids screaming at you all day, disobedient. You're trying to keep them in line. You're trying to keep the household. You clean up one mess, they make another, and then they go make a mess out of the thing you just cleaned up. And they're back and forth all day. They're totally exhausted. At the end of the day, their, cousin, co- their husband comes home to relieve them, and he says, why isn't dinner done? And she's tempted to lose self-control. And it's likely... That she does. And she will lose self-control all over her husband and children. And then the guilt sets in. I shouldn't have lost self-control. I should have been better. I could have been, I'm a terrible mother. I'm a terrible wife. And the guilt and the shame overwhelms her. And the old ladies are to come alongside her, pick up the pieces, care for her, get her back on her feet, and send her back into the ring. Let's go. You can do this. I know he's, he, he was not thinking in that moment. He came home and he said something dumb. That's okay. Go love him anyway. Your children are a mess. They're disobedient. They're unruly. It's okay. Stick with it. Have control. Don't fall apart in those moments. Turn to the Lord. Sympathize with them. If they want to quit, you're to come alongside and tell them, don't quit. You remember those temptations. Sympathize with them. Elders, even their husbands, can't really sympathize in the same way that you can. God has uniquely gifted you old ladies to sympathize with the young women, to know what they're going through, and encourage them along the way. Next, he says to be pure. This word has sexual connotations to it. So you're to teach the young women not to spend inappropriate time with men who aren't their husband, not to uh, look at raunchy books and and TV shows, 
that unmarried women are to keep themselves pure, whether they get married or not. There is a purity that a woman, a godly woman should have. And the old women are to encourage that. I want you to old ladies to listen up to this real quick. There's something going on in our culture that most of you are oblivious to. Pornography amongst young women is running rampant and escalating at a rate that is remarkable. The access to it is unparalleled in history. It used to be a man problem. It's no longer just a man problem. It is a problem for young women as well. And you old women need to know this because it is inappropriate for me to sit one-on-one with a young woman and ask her about this kind of thing. You understand what I'm saying? So I need somebody to come alongside and say to the young woman, hey, are you struggling with this? I see anger and bitterness in your heart and I can't figure out where it's... Is this a struggle for you? Someone needs to ask that question and I can't do it. So I need you to come alongside of them and ask that question. Okay. Working at home. Working at home. Now this one is, this one required a lot of research because there's a lot of opinions on this one. Um, So I studied the Greek, studied the textual variations, which of course in a passage like this, there's textual variations. Checked all the cross references. I don't want to go through all that today. There's not time. I just simply want to tell you what it's not saying. It's not saying that women should always be at home and that they can't work outside of the house. That's not what it's saying. What it is saying is that women are responsible for the care and keeping of their home and children. Now, you can delegate that out. But God is holding you personally responsible for how that goes. So, for instance, whether you go to homeschool or do private school or public school that's really not what matters how that goes is what matters and you're responsible for that so you need to know what they're being taught you better be involved in it God's going to hold you accountable for that don't just ship them off to somebody else or if you do homeschool don't just take it you know as a lazy thing oh, it's just easier to homeschool I'm not going to really worry about No, you have to be intentional in whatever it is. And if someone chooses something other than you, graciously come alongside, pray with them. By the way, fathers, it's also your responsibility, but we're not talking about them today, so you're kind of off the hook, but it is your responsibility as well. Now, the world says that children are an obstacle to a woman's career. That is false. Now, if you can care for your husband, your children, your home, and have a career, that's great. Go for it. There's no, there's no restrictions here for that. But if your husband, children, and home are suffering so that you can advance your business career, you have different priorities than God. By the way, men, this also applies to you. There are times for your home to suffer. For the kingdom of God, to advance the kingdom of God. Your children, your home, your husband may suffer as you, God calls you to something. But not so that you can advance your career. Or uh, to work to pay off luxuries for a bigger house, a bigger boat. God has not called you women to go work so we can have more extravagant things. By the way, husbands, this is true of you as well. If your wife, husbands, let me just talk to you for a minute here. If your wife desires to be at home and you say, no, you can't be at home. I need you out working because I bought this, that, and the other. I have too, we have too many bills. And by bills, you mean credit card bills because you bought it on credit. Now it's come due. Your finances are tight. And you say, now you need to go get a job. No, you need to sell that junk. Let her be home. We have enough luxury in this country already. What we need is more parental involvement, not more luxury. Now, what this is primarily saying about working at home is that when you're home, you're not to be lazy about it. 
Don't go around the neighborhood gossiping, spending time with the ladies here and there, talking, chat, 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 and at home, everything's falling apart. When you're home, you work hard, not spending time just perusing social media and your house is a mess. Clean it up. Get off of social media. Work hard when you're at home. You're not to spend time wasting the day drunk. Now, in Paul's day, every woman pretty much had to be at home, not, not so much out of cultural pressure, but out of necessity. Everything was handmade, right? There was no pre-made food. There was no McDonald's. There were no appliances, dishwashers, washing machines. Everything was handmade, hand-cooked, hand-cleaned. They were very busy. Our modern conveniences have made this a little bit easier, given us some more flexibility. Not that women have any more time. They're busy with many things. But the, co- the modern conveniences have added some flexibility to our schedules. So there's a larger temptation now, even more, to sit around at home and not work. Now, I don't see a lot of moms in our church doing this. I don't, I honestly, I don't see this as a big struggle for this church. But some of you may. Some of you may really struggle. And you old women are to come alongside these young women and say, hey, when you're home, you need to be working. You need to prioritize your kids, your husband, your home. Let me show you how to do this. Let me show you how to organize yourself. Let me show you how to make good time, make good use of your time, how to prioritize your home. The next thing he says is kind. Now, I want to do this one by just reading what Jesus said because I don't have anything better to say than what he said so turn to Luke chapter 6 verse 35 I'll let Jesus explain to you what it is to be kind Luke 6 35 you can study this on your own it says but love your enemies and do good and lend expecting nothing in return and your reward will be great And you will be sons of the Most High, for he is kind to the ungrateful and the evil. That's what it is to be kind. So we'll keep moving. Okay, go back to Titus 2. And the next one is submission to your own husbands. It's one thing to love your husband. It's another thing entirely to submit to him. Now, Paul is not addressing here the extreme cases of abuse and sin. Obviously, there's those exceptions. And as a young wife, you might be asking, well, what, what are those exceptions? How can, I, how can I possibly submit to this foolish man? What if he doesn't love me or if he doesn't treat me with respect? What does submission even look like? Well, I'm glad you asked. Go get coffee with an old lady and she'll tell you about it. I struggle with how to do, how, I don't know. I can tell you generally, this is what you need to do. What does that look like? On a day-to-day basis, go ask an old lady. She's figured it out. And finally, why do women need to behave in this way? That the word of God may not be reviled. What does that mean, reviled? Blasphemed, ridiculed. When Christians don't live counter to the sinful culture, it blasphemes the word of God. The gospel message is supposed to radically change your life. And if you say, I believe this gospel message, and yet I live the same as everybody else, you blaspheme the word of God. You revile it and say it's not effective. And the world looks at that and said, why would I believe that message? You're the same as everybody else. Well, young women, behave in a godly way and old women are to teach them how to do that so that the word of God may not be reviled these are high stakes okay but how do you do it now I want to demystify this a little bit for you because I think we sometimes we build this up into something that's unattainable I've spoken with uh, many older women who say I, I, I'm just not qualified I don't know how to do it I, what, what do I even do Let me break it down a little bit for you, demystify it. 
First thing, of course, is to get qualified. You don't need a degree in theology. You just need to humbly and faithfully walk with God. Your past doesn't disqualify you. Your past failures need to be understood in light of Scripture. But they don't disqualify you. You need to repent of sin in your life and turn to Christ. If you are not a husband lover, a children lover, you hate those snotty nosed grandkids, you are not qualified. But if your character matches that of a priestess, someone who walks before the Lord, you're qualified. And if you're not, repent. Be trained by the grace of God from your former ways to your new ways and qualify yourself to be a disciple and a mentor to a young lady. Know your Bible well. You've got to know this well. If your advice comes from your own head, your own heart, or the world, it's garbage. Your advice needs to come from Scripture, and if it comes from Scripture, you have to know it in order to be able to share it. So know Scripture. Second thing you need to do is to get to know the younger people. Now, this isn't hard, okay? When I, whoever comes up at the end will pray and dismiss, and you're dismissed to go home, and a majority of you will be to your car in 2.3 seconds, okay? Now, to get to know the younger people, you could just hang around for about five minutes and look around you and say, are there any young people here that I don't know very well? And just walk up to them. Hey, my name is. Hey, what's your name? This is simple, okay? Get to know them a little bit. Maybe if you hit it off, invite them over for dinner. Yeah, I wouldn't mind spending a couple hours with that person. That'd be good. If that goes well, say, hey, let's, let's get coffee together. Let's just chat, see how life goes. Now, you're not going to connect with everybody. Don't feel like you have to connect with everybody. You won't. You'll talk with somebody like, I just, I don't understand where they're coming from. It doesn't make any sense. It's okay. Somebody else will connect with that person. But you just need to get to know everybody in the church and say, hey, you know what? There's somebody that, I, I, man, my God was just tugging on my heart for that person. I'm going to spend some time getting to know them. You could join a, a different growth group. Maybe you're in a growth group that is filled with all 70 plus year old people. Okay. Maybe you join a second group. And say, hey, I'm going to spend some time with these younger people. And if you're like, well, which group do I join? Um, if only we had a pastor who knew all of the growth groups and who's in each one. That's me. Come talk to me. And I'll be happy to say, hey, here's one that would fit. There's a lot of young people here. You can go in and, well, there's young people. It's going to be awkward. Yes, it will. That's okay. Go be awkward for the sake of the gospel. Mix it up. At church events, intentionally sit with younger people. We are naturally drawn to people who are like us. It's okay in, 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 in small quantities to be drawn to people. You're comfortable there. They're the same age. They understand me. I get that. That's okay. But every once in a while, intentionally, go sit with somebody who's younger than you, who you don't know very well. Just mix it up with them. If you connect, have another relate. Go. Let's go to dinner. Come on over to my house for dinner. Bring your husband. Bring your kids. Let's get to know each other. Spend time with them. It's not hard. It's not complicated. You don't have to have an intensive Bible study every time you get together. Now, certainly that should and could be a part of it. At some point in the relationship, you say, hey, let's, let's study the Bible together. Or let's read this book together. That's great. Do it. But it doesn't have to be every single time. Because here's the deal. Life provides opportunities. A good parent looks for opportunities to talk about spiritual things. As life happens, a good parent will always have their radar up and say, hey, this is an opportunity. This life circumstance provided an opportunity to talk about spiritual things with my child. A good spiritual mother does the exact same thing. As you spend time with someone in their home, in your home, talking over coffee and dessert, the challenges of life will provide opportunity to talk about the things of God. having trouble with your jerk husband that's an opportunity your kids are disobedient and unruly that's an opportunity you're exhausted by the mundane chores of the day 
that's an opportunity. You don't have to have all of the answers for all of those things, but you need to point them to the one who does, Jesus Christ, through the word of God. Because remember, sound doctrine is applied relationally. Your advice and counsel needs to be based on sound doctrine, but don't make sound doctrine the goal. The goal is godliness through sound doctrine applied relationally. Now, if you're in this church, young woman in this church, you have a lot of opportunity for sound doctrine, to be taught sound doctrine. You go to ABF on Sunday morning, you come to second service, you're taught sound doctrine, you're taught sound doctrine. You go to a mid- midweek Bible study, sound doctrine. Maybe you go to women's ministry on Thursday morning, Wednesday night, taught more sound doctrine. Your own personal Bible study, Bible reading, taught sound doctrine. What we don't need from old ladies is more teaching on sound doctrine. We need more relationship applying that sound doctrine to their lives. That's where the hole is. That's where the gap is. We don't need more head knowledge. We need to know how does that translate from my, from my specific situation in life. Tell me, I, I, I know that Jesus died for my sins, but how does that have anything to do with my disobedient children? Let me tell you. The young women need someone to love on them, encourage them, assist them, cry with them, pray with them. That's what they need. And you old women have a unique gift from God to do this. Yes, young mature women should and could be discipling others. That's a given. But you old ladies have a unique gift, experience of life and wisdom to speak into these young women's lives. If you've learned wisdom and understand your life in light of Scripture, we need your help. Young ladies, the old ladies may not have done life the way you want to. Maybe they sent their kids to public school and you want to homeschool. Maybe you have a job outside the home and they only stayed at home. That's okay. You can humbly and graciously say, hey, they did it differently, both of you, they did it differently, but there are still lessons to be learned from them. Just because you don't do it the same exact way doesn't mean the principles behind what you decided don't apply they do young ladies listen to the old ladies they have so much to offer sit and listen with them seek counsel from them spend time with them invite them into your home don't be afraid to go over to their home let your kids break their fancy china it's just stuff well ladies it's not worth it let those little kids just destroy your knickknacks patty wax get them in your home my, my child my home's not childproof Neither is mine, and I got five of them. They find the weak spot, trust me. (laughs) My mom taught me a valuable lesson. She didn't know it. She had a favorite vase from her her mother, who's since passed away, and my older sister wanted to do something with it, and she got it out, and she broke it, smashed all over the floor. She destroyed mom's favorite vase. I'm in so much trouble. My mom looks up. It's just stuff. Sweeps it up, throws it away, and moves on. It's just stuff. Invite them into your home. Go into their home. Make time for it. Make it a priority in your life. I'm so busy. I've got this thing, that thing, and that. I've got this kid's got this practice and that practice, and I've got this thing to do and that thing to do. I don't have time for godly women to speak into my life is what you're saying. Make time. It's so important. As elders, we need your help filling the gap, ladies. We can teach sound doctrine generally to young women. That's what we're doing. What we can't do is teach it in a way that you can, relationally. Now, as a church, we may have young ladies teaching young ladies biblical truth. Good. We may have young ladies teaching old ladies biblical truth. Good. But if we don't have old women investing in the young women and teaching and applying biblical truth, then we're not doing what Titus 2 is calling us to do. And we run the risk of letting false teachers and false doctrines affect and take away our young women. Old women, we need you. Let's pray. 
Lord God, we thank you for our old women. They are a blessing to us at Country Oaks Baptist Church. Lord, to have as many as we do that love you and love your word uh, is a privilege. And Lord, we ask that you would encourage them to step up, to spend time with these younger women, to get to know them, and to teach them how to be godly people, that they would set the godly example. Lord, Lord, I pray that the busyness of the young women would not get in the way, that they would be busy spending time with older women. Lord, that that was what their life would be about. Learning to be godly. Lord, may we be unified around this. We pray for your blessing on our church through the old women and the young women, that your word may not be reviled. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.